Thank you, Lord. If you have your Bibles, will you turn them quickly, please, to 2 Samuel, the 16th chapter. The message today is entitled, An Oracle of God. An Oracle of God. I'd like to read here this scripture here as a text to begin with. In 2 Samuel, the 16th chapter, beginning at verse 23. And that is the last verse of the chapter. And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Solomon. Here was one that David put a lot of trust in, Ahithophel. This was during the great experience of, of David, which was a very tragic experience when Absalom had rebelled against his father had usurped the uh, throne and claimed he was going to, you know, he seized the throne virtually and disposed of his father. His father had to flee for his life. And Ahithophel was David's counselor that when you heard him speak, it was like talking at the oracle of God. I mean, you inquired of him just like you was inquiring at the oracle of God. Well, how many of you really knows what an oracle is? Now that's the problem I want to get on to begin with here, is to enlighten you on what an oracle is. First I'm going to give you the biblical, or know the dictionary first, the dictionary definition of an oracle. It is this, a person in communication with deity. A person in communication with deity. Secondly, it means a person of great knowledge and wisdom. Now, we want to know the biblical account of what an oracle is in uh, 1 Kings, the 6th chapter. You might turn there. It's the only place in the Bible you're going to be able to find it very readily to determine what an oracle is. In 1 Kings, the 6th chapter, and verse 16 beginning. Now, Solomon was building the temple of God. That's first. I told you correctly. 1 Samuel. The sixth chapter and verse six. Uh, I beg your pardon, I got to the wrong, wrong Samuel here. Let me get to the sixth chapter here quickly. Verse 16. First Samuel. I'm still a little bit confused. <laughs> I got this. First Kings, the sixth chapter. First Kings, the sixth chapter. Now Solomon is building the temple. Verse 16 will begin. And he built 20 cubits on the sides of the house, both the floor and the walls with boards of cedar. He even built them for it within, even for the oracle, even for the most holy place, the oracle. All right, let's continue. And the house, that is, the temple before it was 40 cubits long. And the cedar of the house within was carved with, with knots and open flowers, all was cedar. There was no stone seen. And the oracle he prepared in the house within to set there the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And the oracle in the forepart was 20 cubits in length and 20 cubits in breadth and 20 cubits in the height thereof. And he overlaid it with pure gold and so covered the altar which was of cedar. So Solomon overlaid the house within with pure gold. And he made a partition by the chains of the gold before the oracle, and he overlaid it with gold. All right, the Holy of Holies that was within that temple that Solomon built, there was a place made there for that priest to go and communicate with God, and that was where God spoke from. God would speak to that priest, and there was only one fellow could go in there and communicate with God, and as the definition in the dictionary says it's a person in communication with deity there wasn't many people like that that could speak as an oracle of God in the old covenant now I'm not going to get into the depths of that and explain it any further that's enough said it was the holy of holies within the temple where the priest went in and communicated with God and took orders from God he was in direct communication with deity that was the oracle in which God spoke. 
All right, this Ahithophel was as if he was the oracle of God. Now let's go to the New Testament and find out what relationship an oracle has to you and I in 1 Peter, the fourth chapter. 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, is a very wonderful place to take heed to. Now, verses 10 and 11. As every man hath received a gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, now he's talking here about a man with a gift. Okay, now it says that man can minister through that gift as a good steward of the manifold, that's the many faceted graces of God that covers a lot of ground, a lot of parts of our life. Uh, and he goes on now, verse 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. He's got to be in communication with deity and be able to tell you what God said. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. If any man speak in this age of grace, let him speak as the oracles of God. My Lord, have mercy. What a command of the Holy Spirit of God to you and I. And I'm going to tell you something. In crises, in your life or my life, in all history, it may not have happened in your life as, as uh, primarily as it did back in the Old Testament and in the Bible record, but it should. Every crisis of every man in history that was important to God, there's an oracle of God showed up. That was someone that was in communication with deity that heard from God and could tell you what God said for that particular individual to do. And what I want to do today is to consider the examples of the men and women in the Bible who sought counsel from God's oracle and he either prospered or he suffered tragedy and death and defeat because he rejected the counsel of the oracle of God. Some accepted men speaking as oracles of God and some rejected the message of men speaking as oracles of God. And it's still true today, is it not? Yeah. Of course it is. And we can see tragedy and we can see success as resulting from the message of the man who is in contact with deity. All right? I want us to look at some of the people in the Bible that prospered from it. Noah was God's oracle in his day. He heard from the Lord. You want know to prove it? <laughs> Praise God. Go back to the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis. Right over in the beginning of your holy Bible. Genesis, the sixth chapter. All right. Now, verse 8 says, when God was fixing to destroy the world, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The verse before says, The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Do you know of any other preachers that found grace in the eyes of the Lord? No, you don't. And the world was filled with people in that particular uh, part of the earth. We don't know about over here in that day. We found a lot of uh, archaeology and excavations to prove that there has been people over here on this part of the world a long time before our ancestors arrived. The Aborigines, which are Indians and other primitives that we're not quite so sure about. That was before the flood. We find their skeletons, we find remains of their civilizations and so forth. But that, that's all things that are in, they're not, they're not indisputable by any means. This whole mess of evolution and all is very debatable. But I tell you what, you read in the, in the Bible, it's not debatable. Now he says in verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. No, hey, here's an oracle of God. Here's his qualification. Noah was a just man. And he was perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Woo! What an oracle. <laughs> and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also 
also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence like it's becoming today. Jesus said it'd be like it was in the days of Noah at his return. God looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, now is he in communication with deity? Sounds like it to me. Was he an oracle of God? It sounds like it to me. Listen to this. God said unto Noah. Now he didn't have Solomon's temple with that uh, physically created oracle that God honored and respected. But he was, he was chosen as an oracle of God. God spoke to Noah. And he said to Noah, he's the only preacher, the only one that got the revelation. The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, here's his directions. And you don't believe God had a man that would carry it out? You read the last verse of this, of this particular uh, chapter in Genesis. Verse 22. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Yeah. Hey, there's some things here that's not obvious. You had to get them in the New Testament. I thank God for this book of great record. You don't find it in one place. You find it here a little and there a little. Amen. Precept yeah. on precept. You find a line over here and a line over there. Amen. And then you put it together and you have the composite picture of prophetic revelation like God wants us to have. And you don't get it no other way. You can't get it out of Genesis 6 altogether. What happened in the days of Noah. He gave him the, de the description of that. The dimensions. All the architect, architectural, uh, mental picture, God gave it to Noah. He got the picture. I guarantee you if he, he had to done it, he could have drawn you an architect's uh, view of that ark before he ever built it. He knew exactly what it was going to look like. Because God gave him the mental description here of it. In verse 17, God said, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. And then you hear people say, God, don't do things like this. He told Noah, I said, I'm going to do it. Do you believe the Bible? you believe some old long-bearded theologian that don't believe it? Well, I believe what it says. God says, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth. I will destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything in the earth is going to die and I'm going to kill it. That's what God Almighty said. And you know what? God Almighty can do what he says he's going to do and he'll do it. He don't give a hook whether you like it or not. Did you know that? Did he ask you or me or anybody else if he could do it? <laughs> no, he didn't. And he's not going to do it in this end time either. He's done got it all planned and figured out and He's got the script all written of how it's going to turn out. Here it is. A lot of people don't understand it, but it's here. All right? But he says to Noah, With thee I'll establish my covenant, and you'll come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with thee, and of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, you'll bring into that ark to keep them alive with thee, and they shall be male and female of the fowls and so forth. Now, Noah did according to all God told him. Now, he got in that ark and he was saved. He was on that ark 110 days. And then when after 110 days, he opened the ark and behold, the ground was dry. The judgment of God had passed. Everything was dead except Noah and what was on that ark. He didn't have to take fish in there because there's plenty of water. Well, he didn't have to take no fish in that boat. There's plenty of water for them fish. But when that, that flood was over, 110 days later, 40 days of rain, and then those subsequent days of waiting, 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 waiting. 110 days after God shut the door, he told Noah to open it. God shut it, but Noah opened it. And he looked out and he said, Behold, the ground, the earth was dry. And there wasn't a a breath of nothing living on that earth of vegetation, animals, fowls, or humanity. Everything was dead except what was on that ark. 
And Noah opened the ark. Eight people was all there were. You came from Noah. Did you know that? And before he turned the animals and fowls and all the loose, God said, you take some clean ones and you get out there and build an altar and you sacrifice some of those clean animals to me. See, he told him here, he said, you'll take the clean fowls and the clean beast by sevens. You take, but of the unclean, you'll only take two of skunks and two possums and two rabbits and two raccoons and all of other things. You only take two. But when you put them little sheep and goats and turtle doves and pigeons and little vultures and all them things, you only take two. But them pigeons and turtle doves, you take seven. And when he opened the door, God said, wait a minute, don't you turn them loose yet. You take the very best out of them and you sacrifice them to me. And you know what? God did another wonderful thing there. He smelled the savor of that sacrifice that Noah offered in faith. And the Bible said God made him a promise. He said, I won't ever destroy this world again by water like I've done. And he did a miracle. He said, every time it rains, I'm going to put a bow up in the sky yeah. to remind you that I promised you I'm not going to drown you. <laughs> Praise God. Isn't that something? Yeah. Praise the Lord. But there's more to it than that. I want you to turn over here to 2 Peter and let's find out some more about this oracle of God and what happened to those that didn't believe it. You don't believe God's oracle, you're going to be destroyed. 2 Peter 2, verse 4, God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, who? A preacher of righteousness. Holiness preacher, praise God. Holiness is not a church. Holiness is a lifestyle that God has demanded of his people who will be saved. It is a lifestyle. He was a preacher of righteousness. He was God's oracle in his day. And he said he brought in the flood of the, upon the world of the ungodly, but he saved Noah and his family, a preacher of righteousness. Well, old brother Paul had something to add to that. In the 11th chapter, in verse, let's go back to the 11th chapter, in verse 7 of Hebrews. Hebrews 11 and verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. What kind of fear? An old phobia fear and a rational fear? No, the fear of God was upon this man. And he prepared an ark to the saving of his house by that which he condemned the world. He was an example to the world around him. He was God's oracle speaking God's message. And God says, you do what Noah does. You live like Noah preaches. Yeah, God, I made him my example to you. You live like Noah, do like Noah, or I'll drown you, bless your hearts. Did God keep his word? He sure did. Noah preached and built an ark for 120 years. And people, they listened, but they didn't move with the fear of God on them like Noah did. And he became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. That's the kind of faith we're going to have to have to get out of here alive. Raptured or died or anything else. Another great miracle happened to this man who was an oracle of God. God never gives up till he sees there's no hope for people. He don't give up easily. He's kind of a diehard, if you might, if I might say. Sears Roebuck don't have all the diehards <laughs> batteries. <laughs> <laughs> You're serving a God that's a die hard. Boy, he, he don't give up very easy. You better be glad he don't. Amen. You better be real glad he don't give up very easy. America doesn't been destroyed if he gave up on us very easily. Because this nation's worthy of it. My right, God have mercy. But you know, the last day. In the seventh chapter, God told Noah, seven days, and I'm going to start that flood. The flood's going to start. They'd never seen it rain. 
and all the dew just came up, the, a mist came up from the earth and watered the face of the whole ground. You didn't have to pray for rain back in them days. First thousand, uh, two thousand years about of the uh, existence of this world in its present form, there was no rain. There was a mist came up from the ground and watered the face of the whole earth, the scripture says. But the Bible says in chapter 7, seven days before the rain started that they'd never seen. He was the only prognosticator. They didn't have him on TV. Every station had his little cute little weatherman out there with a chart and little thing saying, it's going to be 70 tomorrow and it's going to be 35 tonight and it's going to be four-day forecast. And Noah had a forecast for 120 years. <laughs> he bettered old Mama's birthday almanac. Praise God. <laughs> he was an oracle of God. He could forecast the weather. He said, you've never seen it rain, but you're going to see it rain. And they mocked him. But, yeah, I had a vision about this flood. You need to tell me what it was like. I had a vision God gave me about what was going on back, back there in those days. And it's terrible. It's terrible the unbelief that he encountered. That preacher's out there saying, well, we believe part of what he said, but we ain't going to believe it all. And they got drowned, and I saw their bodies floating in that great vision on the top of that flood. Little babies. Them defying uh, Noah, the man with a vision, with a message, the oracle of God. God to do his last work in his last reaching outreach for mercy. He said to Noah, bring all them animals into the ark. How you going to get them in there? Elephants, tigers, jaguars, lions, all them wild rascals, good land. He only had one day to do it. How's he going to how's he going to catch all them? He didn't have Frank Buck there to help him or nothing. God said, come on, bring him in the ark, Noah. Oh, Lord, boy, I like what God did. Woo! Them sons of God out there, the Bible talks about in Genesis 6 and 1, said, when the sons of God saw the daughters of men were fair, they chose them wives of all which they, took them wives of all which they chose. The sons of God married the daughters of men and mixed the holy seed with those heathen. And God says, I'm not going to put up this foolishness. Mixing the world up with the Christians, in other words. The sons of God got all mixed up with the world. And they stood out there and watched Noah. They stood out there and watched Noah. And God did his last miracle. Before destruction, God's going to do many miracles. He's going to send two great prophets back of restoration, Amen. Revelation 11. Before Jesus comes, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. Jesus is not going to come. Until this church is restored. It's in a mess. And those two prophets are coming. Revelation 11. You read Revelation 10 and verse 7. It says when the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. The mystery of God should be finished. The church is not going to be taken out of this world. Until the mystery of God is finished. In Revelation 10 and 7 it begins. In Revelation 11. Verse 15 it says, the seventh angel sounded, and there were voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are now become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. And there was an earthquake, and thunders, and lightnings, and the nations were angry, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that God should give rewards to his servants of prophets and his saints, great and small, and to all that fear his Name. See, the time of thy wrath, he says, is now come after the seventh angel signs. That's three and one half years deep in the tribulation of seven years. Jesus is not coming until the church goes three and one half years into that tribulation. When the seventh angel sounds, that is the signal for Christ to return just ahead of of the day of God's wrath, he'll be doing miracles by those two prophets of Revelation 11. Fire come out of their mouth and destroy their enemies. They'll call for a famine to fall upon the earth. Every city they go to that will not receive them, they'll put plagues on that city. They'll turn the water of that city or that individual to blood that won't hear the message of these two oracles of God that's going to stand up in God's last valiant attempt to turn this old rebellious nation back to God and restore the church of Jesus Christ back to its divine unity and faith and love and power like the early church of 
Jesus Christ and is not coming until it's accomplished. You look till you get bug eye like a Bramer bull and look in a room that you're not going to see no sign of Jesus coming until these things happen. He's not coming! I know for at least three and a half years because it hasn't even started yet. God have mercy sakes. What a mess. Church of Jesus Christ is in. All right, what was that last miracle? God's going to do them just before Jesus comes to, right up to the bitter end, just before his day of wrath. The Lord moved on those animals out in that forest that Noah's community was surrounded by. And don't think God didn't already know in advance the day, the time, the hour. He had them animals already gathered up. They was out in the woods. And when he threw the door open, he done had in the food. He done didn't have the survival kits already in place. He had everything all prepared, the pitch. They wasn't a leak in that boat, top, bottom, side, or nowhere. He pitched it within and he pitched it without. He didn't take any chances. The last miracle, while then sons of God looked with old blurry, unbelieving eyes, God did his last miracle. He put the fear of God on those animals and on those fowls that were going to fill that ark for their survival and to replenish the earth after the judgments of God had passed over. The fear of God fell on them. And when Noah opened the door to the ark and dropped the gangplank, here they come, bellowing, screaming, yelling to the top of their voices. They come two by two and marched up the gangplank into the ark, into the places God had prepared through Noah. And there they came out, bellowing and screaming ahead of that wrath that was about to fall. And them sons of God's out there looking with old bleary, unbelieving eyes. We don't believe Noah. Too bad. God says, I'll drown you, Codgers. Yeah. He's going to do it again. Well, it's going to be fire. It's not going to be water this time. Jesus said, our days of this end time age would be characterized by the same things that happened in the days of Noah that are prophetically forecast and revealed. He said it would be like that again. People can't believe it. Oh, maybe so too. No, it'd be like the days of Noah. It'd be like the days of Noah. The earth was filled with violence, and the earth was corrupt before God. And the sons of God had intermarried. It just don't mean the boys. It meant the sons of God. In Bible terminology, he calls men and women both sons of God most places. That they have intermarried. They have mixed. They have mixed and mingled the holy seed of the word of God with this old polluted seed of this old theology that's arisen, this neo-Pentecostalism and all this ungodly mess of humanism that's corrupted the doctrines of the word of God and they brought it into the church and there's nothing but a mixed multitude for God to deal with. A mixed multitude. And nothing but separation can cure the ills of the church. God has got to have somebody to separate the saints or the wheat from the tares. The tares and the wheat's growing up together. These old sorry preacher says you're supposed to let them grow together. You are out there in the honky-tonk or somewhere like that on the job, we'll say. In the schools, maybe. In the military. In a lot of places. But I want to tell you one thing. The church is a place God never intended the tares and the wheat to grow up together. The church is a separate unity. The church is a place where it should be clean by all means. It should be a place where you can take your boys and girls. There's no cigarette smokers. There's no whoremongers. That is, I mean, you just put up with them. Just hang around and invite them with open arms and call them brother and sister. Brother and sister, your foot. Bunch of devils. Churches infiltrated with them. All kind of old pride and lust. 
greed, rebellion, all of it just coexists so abundantly in the churches today that you cannot separate the wheat from the tares, the saints from the phonies. But I can. Not that I can go and put my finger on them, but I can preach the Word of God and I can sift them out. Praise God, that'll separate them. Every great man in the Bible that spoke as an oracle of God was a great separator. He wasn't a mixer. That's a barroom man. He takes them drinks and shakes and mixes them up. Praise God, a preacher, a man of God is a good separator. He separates the saints from the phones. And he himself separates himself so that God can use him not only to be a spokesman or a preacher of righteousness, but to be an example for the other people of God like Noah was in his day. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Noah, by faith, moved with fear, with the fear of God, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the ungodly world around him and the church too, and became heir of that righteousness which was by faith that only Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord through. Is it going to be like that again? Jesus said it would be. It'd be in this end time like Noah's day. It would be in the end time like Sodom and Gomorrah. Only Lot and even just a part of his family got out of that condemned city and the terrible overthrow that followed by God's divine judgment. It's going to be like that again, ladies and gentlemen. There's an old Negro spiritual that they used to sing back in my days when we got so much of this old white and black enmity. And they'd sing a song, everybody talking about heaven ain't wide there. And that's certainly the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In every crisis, God has to raise up an oracle of God, a man who will speak as an oracle of God and not be afraid of men's faces or parley with them about their money. In the 17th chapter of Luke, verse 26, And as it were in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man, his return. These are the words of Christ, our Lord and Master. They did eat. They drank. Hey, wait a minute. You say we've always eaten and drank. Yes, we have, but he's not talking about eating and drinking moderately. He's talking about excessive, intemperate eating, satiating ourselves with drink and food and pleasure. He's talking about excessive. That's gluttony. They did eat, they drank. They married wives, they were given in marriage, married, divorcing excessively until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all, every last one of them. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they built it, the planted, they built it. Same thing we do in the day, it's not talking about you're not supposed to build a house, it's talking about excessive building. That's all people think about, building another condominium, building another project for a subdivision, for housing, making a fortune up quick off of some unwitting fellow with a bunch of old plywood nailed on some boards and a little bit of, of a facade of veneer on the outside and charge him $100,000 for a $25,000 cracker box? Yeah. That's extortion. Yeah, That's what this country's full of. Yeah. You watch it build these houses old tinder box put up there and tell you some big tale about how wonderful it's constructed. Most of them's constructed just like these old mobile homes, just thrown together and you huff and puff and blow your house in real quick. Yeah. You look at old mobile home, how they assemble them things together, little old strips of wood. Shoot, you can go up there and hit it and ram your fist right through the side of the thing. Now we'll charge you a fortune for it. That's what the Lord's talking about. That's what he's talking about. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Revealed? What do you think that means? It means unveiled. That the world will know who he is. Praise God. They don't know the Christ of the Bible. They know 
us taking another Jesus. Another Jesus. Then he goes on down and says in verse 32, you better remember Lot's wife. For whosoever will seek to save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, verse 34, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. He says, In that night. At the beginning of that heading. All right, listen to what Jesus said here in verse 31. In that day. There's two time elements. First, Jesus said, in that day. If you own the house top, your stuff in the house, don't come back and get it. In verse 34, he said, I tell you, in that night. How's Jesus going to return as a thief in the night? That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about Armageddon here. When he said where the body is, the eagles will be gathered together. He's not talking about vultures either. He's talking about eagles. Yeah. The Bible throughout likens a victorious Christian to an eagle. Yeah. With sensitivity to a storm that's arising. When an eagle senses a storm coming in the far distance, he either goes to his area, they call it, a nest that's cradled in a rock that's safe, and if it's exposed... It's going to be exposed to the violence of the storm. He soars and soars and soars and soars until he rises above the violence of that storm that's about to descend. He's talking about saints saying when they leave this world, we'll rise up above the storm and the wrath of God. People accuse me of not believing in a rapture because I tell them there's no rapture imminent. It's at least three and one half years away because it's halfway in the tribulation period. God's going to purge the church. He's going to judge the American, the nations of the world, with his divine judgments before the Antichrist gets here and begins his time of wrath. Judgment is not wrath. Judgment is chastening. There's people going to repent in God's judgments. God's going to turn a lot of folks in America back to the Lord in his sore judgments. Four of them the Bible mentions. Terrorism. I'm starting to say family. I'll put that on the end. Terrorism. Natural disasters. We call them natural. They're divine disasters like earthquakes and storms and floods and uh, early freezes and droughts and so forth. All right? Plagues. Epidemics. Incurable diseases are going to rid this country. And then fourthly, Family. That's the thing that's going to break God's people. You read in the history of the history of the church of the living God from the time Moses brought that church out of Egypt, and it was a church. Read Acts 7:38. This was he that was in the church in the wilderness. God called it a church. An assembly was brought out of Egypt. From that time till today, no church in history that has backslidden or apostatized from the Lord has ever returned to the Lord without famine. Read your book. In Amos, the 8th chapter, God said, I've sent mildew and blasting on you. You haven't returned to the Lord. He said, I dried up one city and there was water in another. And you went from the city dry to the city that had water and you got water but you haven't returned to me, saith the Lord. I sent the sword among you, he says, yet you've not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And every time you read when they return to the Lord, you remember Elijah, 1 Kings 17 on Mount Carmel, after three and one half years of drought and famine, no rain, he got on Mount Carmel with him, he said, hey, let's pray, the God that answers by fire, let him be God. All Israel was humble. The king was there. The preachers were there. The church members were there. And he prayed 63 words and the fire fell. And they said, let God be God. Amen. And then, then it rained again. Then it rained. 
when they make God truly their God. Pleasure is the God of America. It's not a pleasure that. It's not just watching TV and having a little fun shooting marbles. It's a stinking mess of ungodly, exotic pleasure. Exotic pleasure. You know what that is, don't you? That means the human body desecrated through nudity and sex and immorality of every kind and homosexuality and lesbianism and drunkenness and dope addiction, everything defiling the human body. That's exotic pleasure. God says, I hate the stinking mess. He's going to judge it too. This church ain't going nowhere. God, God gets the church straightened out. The church is responsible for the rest of what's happening in America. And basically preachers. The preachers are responsible because they won't preach the unadulterated, uncompromising word of God. They got to water it down and compromise to get money. But you look at me, one fella who won't compromise to get a dollar out of you. Amen. Amen. Just try. Yeah. Just try. Praise God. I've lived off of bird seed like Elijah has, and I've lived some time with steak. But I've had a lot more bird seed than I have steak, my family died. <laughs> Old Elijah, when he prayed that famine down on Israel, three and a half years, God had to send the ravens out to feed him. The birds had to feed him. Praise God. But the Lord will take care of a man that will speak as an oracle of God. In other words, He's in communion with deity, and he tells the people what God said. Not what he thought, or what some old theology book, or some denomination, what the tradition of the elders are. Follow the tradition of the elders. Amen. That's not sacred. Jesus condemned that mess everywhere he went. He said, well, did he say his prophesy of you hypocrites say that you, <laughs> you honor the tradition of the elders and forsake the commandments or reject the commandments of God. Oh Lord, that's what they're still doing ladies and gentlemen. Now I want to show you just a couple individuals here beside old brother Noah that, that listened to God but they didn't listen very good. I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles the 26th chapter. These are things that are lamentations ladies and gentlemen. 2 Chronicles 26 all the people of Judah took Isaiah. He was 16 years old and made him king between, in the room of his father Amaziah. He built Eleth and restored it to Judah. And after that, the king slept with his fathers. Remember now that he reigned. Well, it tells you in the next verse. Okay. 16 years old was Isaiah when he began to reign. And he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah did. Now listen to this. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah who had understanding in the visions of God. Now Zechariah was an oracle of God and he directed the life of this young king until he died. Then things changed. He didn't listen to a man speaking as an oracle of God alone. He just listened to the young Turks. And they corrupted him. Listen to this, though. And so as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And he went forth and warred against the Philistines and break down the wall of Gath and so forth. Verse 7, God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabians. Verse 8, the Ammonites gave gifts to us, and his name spread abroad even to the entering end of Egypt, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem. And so forth. Verse 10, he built towers in the desert. He digged many wells. He had much cattle. He, he loved husbandry. Verse 11, moreover, as I had a host of fighting men that went out to war by bands according to the number of their account. Verse 12, the whole number of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were 2,600. That was that many captains. And under their hand was an army, 300,000, 7,500, and made war with mighty power. Verse 14, Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host shields and spears and helmets and habitants and bows and slings to cast stones. He made in Jerusalem engines and invented by cunning men to be on the towers and the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. 
His name spread far abroad. Listen to this, what a lamentation. For he was marvelous, marvelously helped till he was strong, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride, the middle letter of your destruction is I. Any Christian's destruction, the middle letter is I, pride. If you're successful, if you're a success as a Christian, if you are an overcoming Christian, the middle letter of your success is I. F-A-I-T-H. Old I is in the middle of either one. You choose faith to walk with God and trust God, the middle letter is I. You better, you're going to have to do it. But when you go down swinging and you fall victim to heartache and tragedy and sorrow and bad health and failing business and a wrecked home, the middle letter is I. Pride! You destroy yourself through pride. Here, when he was strong, a man that listened to Zechariah, an oracle of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, he made him to prosper. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. He got to be a smart aleck. He thought because he was king and strong and honored and his armies were victorious and the nation sent gifts and God have mercy, he was respected worldwide. Oh, I don't have to listen to that man of God anymore. I'll go in and do my own thing. So he took a censer with incense and he went into the temple to worship God. And that was directly against God's law. He had a priest ordained and sanctified to go into that place and inquire at the oracle of God, not a king. And what happened? Azariah went after him with fourscore priests of the Lord were valiant men. And they withstood him and said, Azariah, it appertaineth not to thee to burn incense to the Lord, but the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated. Go out of the sanctuary, for you've trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord. And Isaiah was wroth. He got fighting mad with these preachers, telling him the truth, and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the men of God, the leprosy rose up in his forehead. Leprosy throughout the Bible is a, a type of sin. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in the forehead, and they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out, because the Lord had spent him. A man that had been a great man, 16 years old, he began to seek the Lord when he was very young, and God made him to prosper because he sought the Lord and he trusted Zechariah speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he prospered, but now he goes down. And he was a leper to the day of his death and dwelt in a several house being a leper and was cut off from the house of the Lord. They wouldn't let him go to church anymore. Like somebody today's got the age. Would you want them out here rubbing around on you? That's what's happening in a lot of churches today. You got these bus ministers, they go out and call people to church they don't know one thing about. They're getting fucked with the AIDS. They're having lawsuits all over the country because after they find out they got the AIDS, they're afraid of them. They say, I'm afraid of them. Well, you don't know what you're talking about. These doctors don't eat. They don't know no more about that. That's a plague from the Lord. Where did it start? They can't tell you where it started. They can't tell you how it started. And you don't know how you can, how, how contagious it is either. What, like a prisoner bit a policeman on the leg of their arm. They die, you pig! He knew he had to eat and bit him on his arm. Well, he's had to wait a while to find out if he's got the virus or not. But you don't know how it's transmitted. You just don't know. Here he had leprosy. Leprosy is contagious too. They wouldn't let him go to church anymore. Till the day of his death, and his son reigned over the land. Turn to Second Chronicles, 
the 36th chapter. Verse 11, Zedekiah, the son of a great king named Josiah. Josiah began to reign, this son of his. Chapter 30, no, chapter 34, verse 1, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned 31 years. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He walked in the ways of David, his father, and declined to turn neither to the right hand or the left. Here's his son. What a terrible tragedy in the family of a man of God that he walked with God, served the Lord, and was successful because he had faith. The middle letter of that is I. Praise God. Oh, Lord, listen to this son. Though. He was 21 years old began to reign. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And listen to this. This is the cause of it. And he humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet speaking from the mouth of the Lord. He had a man who was an oracle of God and he wouldn't humble himself before that man and the message that he brought to him. Amen. It'll happen to you too, ladies and gentlemen, in this age. There are a few men who will speak as an oracle of God, and most of them won't. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who made him swear by God, but he stiffened his neck. Verse 14, all the chief priests, all the preachers, listen to this, and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he hallowed in Jerusalem. Listen to this now. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up the times and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. What is the last thing now God does? Instead of putting the animals in the ark with the fear of God on them, he sends you a man of God that will speak as an oracle of God before wrath will come on this nation and church and individual. He sent to them his messengers. They rose up with compassion on his people. But what happened to the people of God? They mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets. These messengers were prophets of God. The people hated their message and despised the men that brought the message. Now what happened? They mocked them until the wrath of God arose against his people. Against who? Against his people. Do you hear that? God's wrath arose against his people. Until or till there was no remedy. There was no altar call. There was no grace. There was no mercy. He didn't send nobody else. He didn't hold out his hand to receive it. He rejected it with finality. His people, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to happen again in this end time. It's already in the workings. We can see the signs of the Antichrist and the false prophet everywhere. My Lord, have mercy sakes in this world. The question for every one of us to answer to ourselves honestly is, do I really want God's direction in my life? Do I really want a man who's an oracle of God and can speak because he has communion with deity and gets his instruction from the Lord? Do I want that man to give me counsel and direction? Do I really want it? The answer is usually no. And it's a tragedy that's unfolding in this age of ours. You can go on. In your own tragic course, that, will, that road will be filled to that tragedy with misery, with heartache, with pain, and a whole lot of emptiness. You can take that, or you can turn. Like old Jonah told the king of Nineveh, he preached, repent, or perish. And the people fasted and repented and turned from their wicked ways, and God saw and destroyed them not. We can either turn, or we can go on and face the calamities that will inevitably befall us. Ezekiel and Ezekiel 37 stood out in a valley of dry bones, which is a type of the church. Now don't tell me what the church, I know it was Israel, but the Bible tells us in the New Testament in a number of places, 2 Peter, the third chapter, verse 3, tells us in Romans 15 and verse 4, it tells us in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 7 through 13, that all the things, in Ephesians 2, verses 19 and 20, that all the things that are written in the Old Testament are written for our learning and for examples to us. Everything in that Old Testament was written to the New Testament church as examples to teach us the ways God would judge us.
for the same type of rebellion and selfishness and the lust of the flesh and the rebellion that those people committed, if this wrath and judgment will be visited upon us, thus saith the Lord. And we've got to take it. And we've got to remember that God is merciful. He's patience is infinite, infinite. God have mercy. Thank you, Lord, that your patience is without understanding. But we've got to remember also that God will give us up when we won't listen to that oracle of God that comes our way and brings us God's instruction. In Zechariah 7, 11, in conclusion, they refused to hearken. They pulled away the shoulders. They stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore, here's the results of them closing their ears and hearts of pulling away the shoulder refusing to hearken to that man speaking from the throne room of God from that oracle. He said, it has come to pass that as he cried, that's the prophet, and they would not hear. So now they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. The days will come when we will not hearken to God's oracle, to the man that God has to communicate with deity to find out God's true message for God's on people that the days will come that they will cry and God will not hear because the prophet cried and they wouldn't take instruction. May God help us to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to this end time Laodicean lukewarm church of Jesus Christ. Folks, don't worry about Wall Street. Don't worry about the World Bank. Don't worry about the collapse of the social security system. Don't worry about a thousand earthquakes in Chile or plagues in China. Look in the mirror of God's word and make your calling and election sure. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we ask you in the name of Jesus to grant us grace in your sight. But Lord, you're going to see about us when these judgments come, terrorism, plagues, divine disasters and famine, that unseen hand that we walk with and hold as Noah, the Bible said he was a just man, that oracle of God. He was a just man. He was perfect in his generations. And he walked with God in that same hand that holds my hand today. That unseen hand is going to supply my need and those that hear in the future that is darkened with Stygian darkness. That the only thing we can see is through the prophetic word. I cannot see it. It's the scientist, the economist, the military genius, the politician, and all these preachers cannot see it. It's only an oracle of God. And God can show, give vision. For where there is no vision, the people perish. I thank you for that vision of Noah's blood, the disaster of that unbelief that evolved in that day as he preached and as that day of the Lord hastened on, they rebelled and they were destroyed. Even thus shall it be again in the day when the Son of Man shall be unveiled or revealed. God help us to take the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip for the word spoken by the prophets and apostles in Christ is steadfast in every disobedience and transgression shall receive a just recompense of reward. God give us ears to hear and heart to understand and spiritual eyes to see these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.